Welcome to the Wealth Studying Podcast. This is episode 442. Today is January 30th, 2024. I'm your host, John Pugliano. I'm also the founder and money manager at investablewealth.com. Well, I've been getting a lot of questions about foreign stocks, investing overseas. You're starting to hear more and more of the talking heads presenting that as an opportunity because U.S. stocks have run up so much and the valuations really just aren't favorable. Everything is lopsided to the technology stocks. We'll talk about that today, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about Chinese stocks. We'll get to all that in a minute, though. First thing I want to mention is that I'll often get asked why I don't interview guests on my podcast. You know, this is 442 episodes. I've never had a guest. I don't intend to ever interview any guests, and the reason for that is that I'm actually very introverted and I just wouldn't do a good job at interviewing guests. And so I don't. There are people that do a much better job than that. One of the people that does a very good job of it in the financial sector and getting big investor names on his podcast is Andrew Horowitz over at the Discipline Investor Podcast. I've been on his show before. He had me on again recently. I'll put a link in today's show notes where you can find that episode. We had a lively conversation about a lot of topics, some having to do with what I'm talking about today, so do check that out. Now, as far as investing outside the U.S., listen, I'm a proponent of diversification. I've often invested outside the U.S. either by buying ETFs that focus on those sectors or by buying ADRs, American Depository Receipts, just outright and owning the companies. I've shied from that in recent years for good reason, and that's because the U.S. markets continue to outperform overseas markets and even in the emerging markets, which are always touted as being high growth. Well, pull up a chart and look at the last 10 years or so, and you'll see that in almost every case, over the long run, the U.S. stocks continue to outperform. No, that doesn't mean they always will, and it doesn't mean that there aren't any opportunities overseas. Believe me, I'm diligently looking every day to find things that I want to invest in. I haven't pulled the trigger yet. One of the reasons that U.S. stocks are performing so well right now is because of the tech sector. And the United States tends to have the biggest and the best tech companies. Now, I'm not totally convinced that artificial intelligence, AI, is going to have the immediate impact on all these stocks like we've seen over the past you know, three months. The run-up we've had, I think, is a little bit of irrational exuberance. So that's why I didn't jump in and I'm not chasing performance now. Nor likewise do I feel that I have to go invest in European or emerging markets or Chinese stocks just because that's supposedly going to be the next best thing. Shortly after the war started in Ukraine... And it's hard to believe now, but that was almost two years ago. We're coming up on the second year anniversary. I never thought it would last anywhere near this long. In fact, I was one of those people in the early days that thought that the Russians would just go in and overrun them and it would be over in a week or two, you know, similar to what has happened in the past with the invasion of Georgia or the invasion of Crimea, or I'm even old enough to remember the invasion of Czechoslovakia. I never thought Ukraine would get enough funding and weapons to put up the fight they have. And that's really created, or at least added to, much of the geopolitical tension that we've had over these last couple years with, we have a war in Eastern Europe, there's a war in Israel, there's contagion spreading around the Middle East, from the Black Sea to the Red Sea to the South China Sea, are all at risk. And then you have just natural phenomena like the Panama Canal not having enough water in it to be able to transport its normal capacity of ships. So there's all types of geopolitical issues, both natural and man-made going on right now, which have continued to weigh on the global market. And to some degree, the United States is insulated from that. And this is where I was going with the whole statement I made at the early days of the Ukraine war. I had put out a video talking about global choke points. And those three main choke points of energy, food, and weapon systems were all beneficial to the United States. Beneficial not only to the fact that we have more than enough to take care of our own nation, but we also have such a surplus we can make profits by selling those items to other countries. 
So that is one of the reasons why the U.S. has continued to outperform the other countries as we get post-pandemic. But that's the situation we're in. And my primary concern is what is happening in China. China is the second largest economy in the world. Remember the old statement that when the U.S. gets a cold, the rest of the world gets pneumonia? Well, the Chinese economy is huge in comparison to you know, virtually all the other economies other than the United States. So I think it stands to reason that when China gets a cold, maybe the rest of the world doesn't get pneumonia, but there is going to be some type of contagion. And, and hey, I'm not referring to any of the uh, Wuhan nonsense. Listen, I'm talking straight economics here. China not only has a cold, China does have pneumonia, or at least severe bronchitis. Their economy is in the tank right now. And it continues to be problematic, even with all the jawboning and the intervention that they're trying to do to prop it up. Now, a lot of people are saying, hey, Chinese stocks are so bad, they look good. And I'm a value-oriented, contrarian-type investor. I mean, I do look at the valuations of companies like Baidu and Alibaba and JD and all the rest, and I am extremely tempted to try and catch a falling knife and buy into these stocks. And I'm not talking put my whole portfolio in, but you know, just 1% or 2% into a couple of these companies to get exposure to that Chinese market because at some point I do know it will turn around. However, having said that, these stocks are cheap for a reason. China has long-term problems from real estate and overbuilding to debt levels to declining demographics as a, and as a consequence of that, higher labor costs. And now that we've got this pending Cold War going on and there's not only the tit-for-tat that's, that's happening in the tariffs, but also we're starting to splinter into more of an old Soviet-style spy versus spy economy like we had back when I was growing up and, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were two distinct economic systems. There was what we called the Western world. That was the U.S. and all the allies. And then there was the Soviet bloc. The Soviet bloc used their own currency. They traded amongst themselves. And we were always competing. I think we're very likely to get somewhat of a similar scenario to that. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And the problems I'm talking about haven't just you know materialized this year. If you remember, going back to the end of 2022, all the smart people and all the pundits were telling you, jump into the Chinese stocks because their economy was being re reopened from all the draconian COVID shutdowns and that the Chinese economy was going to springboard and skyrocket. And, you know, for a brief period of time, the stock market went up. I think it was pretty much uh, maybe December through late January. And then the rally petered out and it's just gotten worse ever since. It's so bad now, in fact, that if you pulled up a long-term chart of China, you'll see that their stock markets are to the lows that they experienced, you know, just prior to the pandemic and then going all the way back to 2008 during the Great Recession. So Chinese stocks are in trouble because the Chinese economy is in trouble. And in fact, speaking of 2008, look at that long-term chart. The Chinese stock markets pretty much peaked in 2007. So it's been a long 15 years of decline and stagnation. And I think it's going to take more than just the jawboning talk and the weak government intervention that we've seen lately to get things moving. So as far as China's future, there's probably three likely outcomes. They could get through these problems and everything could go back to normal, or they could experience some type of a Japanese lost generation where their economy stagnates and declines for 30 years. Or their entire political system could implode like the Soviet Union did. Regardless of what all the experts say, I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen or can adequately assess the probabilities to those three outcomes. So while I continue to think valuations are compelling, I want to wait a little longer. And just as I've done with U.S. economy, when I look at money market funds that are paying somewhere around 5.4%, and I know that my principal is guaranteed. Well, I just don't think the risk reward is there to try and catch a falling knife in some of these other economies. Well, hey, at some point, this will all shift and come on back for future episodes and we'll find out when. Until then, as always, this is John Pagliano wishing you 
the very best returns.